In the days of ancient Egypt, the Ogdoad were eight primordial deities and they each share a similar name because one of them is the male and the other is the female. There is one that represents the sky and water. There is a pair that represents the atmosphere between the heaven and earth. There's one who represents um, the change from night to day. Here now in Yu-Gi-Oh, we, we have a archetype of not just eight, but now 10 different reptiles that all kind of represent the um, different deities of the Ogdoad. That comes not only in the form of eight monsters, but also in the pairs for the level fours of, you know, Nunu and Noya, Curse and Alaric, Aeron and Amunesia. Previously in Ancient Guardians, you only had the ninth Ogdoad, the Ogdo Abyss. Ogdo Abyss is supposed to represent what happens when all the Ogdoadics come together. They create this primordial light of creation. And so that's why it is a light monster and it has water in its artwork, the creation of life. It's like waters of chaos. And all that kind of cool shit. In the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, the Ogdoad has been split into nine monsters, and now two new cards are being created in Age of Overlord to support this deck. Ogdoad, for the past, I think it's been about like two years since this deck came out, I believe, has never really done much. It's been a fun deck where you can kind of like mill your reptiles and sort of use them from the graveyard to set up your board. But think about this deck where the deck is kind of like too fair. If you look at some of your your starters like Curse or Alaric, you start to wonder why are you giving your opponent resources? And so the reason why you're giving your opponent resources is because you're supposed to set up some of your higher level Ogdoads like the Queen of the Abyss and Aaron, King of the Abyss, because those actually mitigate the pluses that you give your opponent. So like you see like Curse special summons a monster from your opponent's graveyard, but while Amunis is on the field, if a monster is summoned to your opponent's graveyard to their field, then you could send another card they control to the graveyard, right? You kind of have to like work up the chain to create stronger and stronger monsters, I, I guess was the intention with the Ogdoad deck. It just didn't work, right? There wasn't enough steam when the deck first came out in like an opening turn to really take advantage of the full gimmick of the deck. And so what you had instead was a bunch of monsters that were like easily interruptible and that couldn't really do much to get an advantage over the opponent. And it also didn't help that Reptiles did not have a lot of support the year that it was made. It did not have a lot of Link monsters. Really, the only re Reptile Link monster was Reptilian Echidna up to that point. Also, the Alien Shock Trooper M-Frame. With uh, Dawn of Majesty came Cosmic Slicer Z-Roll and a new Alien Reptile Link that allowed you to search cards that place A counters. And this card can do a lot by itself, but it needs a lot of setup. To get there and the issue is that this deck did not have the consistency to set up for the cosmic size of zero now with this new age of overlord support the nefer abyss the ogdoatic overlord and the ogdoatic dawn of creation that allow us to set up these things really easily especially because of dawn of creation dawn of creation allows us to tribute a reptile monster then special summon an ogdoatic token or every two levels that it had if you know Ogdodes already, you know that summoning a level 8 Ogdoatic monster is not hard. As a matter of fact, it's it's kind of like mandatory to get into the combo. You summon Curse and you summon Naya and you're allowed to search Ogdoatic Dawn of Creation. And so Dawn of Creation allows you, now instead of just sitting on a level 8 and a level 4 kind of awkwardly and then just only tributing one to get like a rank 8 on board, now you can tribute your level 8 and summon 4 tokens. And you can get a lot off of off of those four tokens because you're not restricted into anything even after you summon those four tokens, which is kind of ridiculous. Searchable card allows you to create five monsters from two. And I will say, although there is no one card combos in this deck, the two card combos do go really hard and we will get into those really soon. Recently, I believe this was in Ghost from the Past 2, they released a lot of generic reptile support just to sort of like keep the deck going. Ogdodes, when they first came out, Again, not a lot of good reptile support, but as time went on, we got the Serpent of Golgonda, we got the Therion Reptile Monster, and then we got Lamia. And Lamia allowed you, when it was normal summon, to search a level 8 reptile from your deck to your hand. That includes the new level 8, well, not Lou, not new at this point, but uh, at that point, new Therion 
uh, Empress Alasia. It allows us to search the lovely Ogdoatic monsters, not that we would want to. It allows us to search Supreme Sovereign Serpent of Golgonda, the Albaz lore monster. It gave us options, and I think Theory on Empress was definitely like the best option that you could search off of Lamia. Now, this year in Fulton Hypernova, we got a new card, the Pharaonic Advent. This card being a pharaoh is, is you know, right on theme for the Ogdoatic archetype because ancient Egypt. Now that we got pharaohs, what Pharaonic Advent does is you contribute any monster to special summon him from your hand. And when he's face up on field, you contribute a fairy, fiend, or reptile monster, and you get to add any continuous trap from your deck to your hand. <laughs> So that is any funny trap in the game. Like there's no restriction to that. The only condition is that you're not allowed to summon for the rest of the turn. But you know, uh, concerning the fact that you can search some of the most broken cards in the game by just tributing a reptile monster after summoning this card that's really easy to summon. It's a really good card to like keep around if you plan to play Ogdoad at this point or at any point in the future. Even this new horror support coming in Age of Overlord, it is a bunch of all eight monsters that center around the King's Sarcophagus spell card. And so you have one of the Horus monsters that can search the King's the King Sarcophagus spell card. And then the King the King Sarcophagus up to four times per turn can mill all four Horus monsters. And then the Horus monsters can then summon themselves back from graveyard. The cool thing is these Horus monsters do not activate when they summon themselves, meaning since tier limits are really good right now, let's say they have a Shuffler in Grave, um, and you have King Sarcophagus on field, and you have like, um, and let's say you use, and let's say you have like only one Horus monster in Grave. Every time on the resolution of you milling uh, a, a Horus monster, they then have to decide: should I use my Shuffler here, or should I wait for them to get another Horus monster in Grave? What you can do is that you can mill one at a time. Like you don't have to mill all four at a time with the King Sarcophagus. Uh, to then mill one and then summon one and then what are they supposed to do about it, right? Because now it's like you're sort of playing around with the resources. And because all the horse are level eight, you get to make a lot of power plays into rank eights like number 90 who can negate monster effects once per turn. Uh, Champion Sargus, who can search uh, cards like Regulus. You got Coach King Giant Trainer, where if you get three of them on board, you may have to skip your battle phase, but you'll draw three cards off of Giant Trainer. Um, or even number 38, because it's a really cool card. Even cards like Divine Dragonite Felgrand that we haven't seen in a while, Din Girsu, which everyone knows about to protect some of your other cards on field. There's a lot of things that you can go for when you're playing the Horus archetype, and it's like discard four cards and summon four level eight monsters from your deck. It makes it sound like you don't want to draw them, but you you kind of want to draw Imsidy over here because Imsidy can discard himself and another card to search King Sarcophagus and then draw you another card from your deck. Meaning that first off, you'll only have to discard three, but because you dropped two to add two cards, you went, you, you did not go neg to activate that. Meaning now you you have King Sarcophagus, which again, you, you will have to activate, but now you only have to discard three cards instead of four. And if King Sarcophagus can survive until like past your opponent's turn and back to your turn, you have the ultimate follow-up because now you have four monsters in Grave that can just be summoned. If they shuffle them back, you can just mill them again with King Sarcophagus by discarding more cards. So Horus is going to be good with, a, with, with decks that want to discard cards, that want cards in their graveyard. And with um, Ogdoatic, although I don't go too much into the combos with Sarcophagus because they are kind of like, you need to draw certain cards with this deck to, to make the most use out of them. It's like, you can sort of like understand the theory. Once you understand how Og Ogdoatic works, you'll easily be able to start applying the Horus monsters to uh, supplement and uh, build that, you know, and create stronger end boards with that strategy. And that's not even the last archetype that we're gonna be uh, mixing Ogdo adds with. There's also Evil Zor. And when I first saw this, I was not a believer, but after trying it out, I, I figured like, holy shit, there is just so much that this deck has access to. And these are usually the, the types of decks that I love to build in Yu-Gi-Oh. Decks that are really like flexible as to, like you can play it like this or you can play it like that. Zombies are kind of like that. Cold Talker is like that, especially. Um, 
and Code Talker is like one of the decks that got me back into the game in Yu-Gi-Oh when, when I was like thinking about uh, quitting. So, yeah, there's a lot going on with Ogdo Addicts and just Reptiles in general. And so we're going to go over Reptile Pal, uh, Reptile Pile. We're going to go into the Alien Lock. We're going to go into um, Horus and we're going to go into Evil Sword in this video. So. Uh, make sure to drop a like if you guys like this kind of content and let's get and, and let's start getting into the combos right before i can show you guys what the uh plethora of, of options are let's just start with what the ogdode can do um sort of like ogdode reptile pal now Although we're starting with Lamy in hand, and I know like this is more generic reptile support, this will be mostly a, a, a reptile combo. So we're bringing out... So we get to discard Nunu to mill any dark reptile monster from our deck, and then if we control no monsters, or we control an, any Ogdoatic monster, we get to special summon Nunu from Grave. But when it's special summoned that way, we're locked into reptiles while it's face up on field. So. This is why some people actually like to play Invoked with their Ogdoatic decks, because um, you can mill, you know, discard Nunu, mill, and then summon it, and then summon Alistair, search Invocation. Now you get the Nunu and the Alistair overlaid into something like King of the Swamp, and you will be able to um, make a monster like Mechaba for after activating the Invocation um, and getting your, you know, getting your Alistair engraved, you know, after you get the Alistair engraved. Now, there's a reason why I don't like that play, and that's because um, there's too many, like, conflicting field spells in the Octoatic deck if you try to mix too many engines in there. So, like, I'd say if you're going to create a deck based around an Octoatic engine, try to focus as much on that one engine as possible and to, like, build around that. So Lamia gets to search Empress Elysia. Then we get to go into King of the Feral Imps. And I, I, I want to remind you, this adds any reptile monster. Like, not just level 4 or lower, but this can add you any reptile monster in the game from deck to hand. And it's generic to level 4. So again, you don't need to you, you don't need two level 4 reptiles. You just need any two level 4 monsters. So that's why you, um, you may see me go into spirit monsters like Sakitama later on. Because they actually really do work for the deck. Uh, so then we search Nilhill... Uh, I'm not no. I'm, I'm looking at the OCG name. Next, we search Naya, the Ogdoatic Remnant. And this one is actually the most important card to resolve. If this card does not resolve, you may not be able to play your full combo. And the reason why is because it mills the most important Ogdoatic that you want engraved, and that's Curse. When Curse is engraved, you can tribute any monster, special summon it from grave, and then you summon out any other level 4 or lower Ogdoatic monster from your graveyard. Which is great because the Naya that we just milled actually has an effect on summon. So it mills a monster that allows you to summon it out from the graveyard. So assuming that we, you know, haven't used our normal summon, you could just normal summon Naya and get its effect, but it's gonna be way more effective to mill curse and then summon Naya just to get that extra body on board, you know? So what I'm doing here is I am at, uh, going into Alasia first, and there's a good reason for that because I want to set up two level eights so that I threaten, so that I threaten Nibiru, because we are we've already summoned three monsters. This is uh, uh, Alasia's number four and Curse's number five. And now, now when Curse is summoned, it gets to summon out Naya, and then because Naya was special summoned, it gets to add one of the most important spells in our deck to our hand, and that is the uh, Ogdoatic Snake Lily. Game, please. Can you? Oh no, it, it doesn't. Okay, so we get to add the Ogdoatic Snake Lily, and so what Snake Lily does is that you you just mill a reptile from deck to grave. It's kind of like Foolish Burial that's still at three, except if you have five or more reptiles with different names in your graveyard, you can summon any reptile monster from your grave. Basically, this says summon a reptile from deck if you have four more in grave, but that's not how we're going to use it. That's not exactly how we're going to use it. The way we're going to use it is 
we are going to mill a reptile that's going to have another effect and then we're going to summon out one of the reptiles that was already in our graveyard so basically this just summons two monsters for us so that's why it's it's really it's really good that we can go into this so now we made number 90 so if they didn't hit us with the nib there then now we're free to make a overlay for number 90 and to protect any future plays that we have from this point on so now we're going to mill Night Sword Serpent, and when Night Sword Serpent is sent to Great by Card Effect, it allows itself to be special summoned. But because we because we already had four on activation, on resolution we get to summon out Lamia from Grave thanks to Snake Lily, and then as a new chain, Night Sword Serpent will trigger, allowing itself uh, allowing you allowing itself to be summoned from the graveyard because it was uh, sent um, to the Grave by Card Effect. But it's banished when it leaves the field. Both Remnant and Night Sword Serpent are banished when they leave field, so I think these two are best to be overlaid into Ricka Queen Strena. And no, we are not on, uh, you know, any crazy Ricka combos, but uh, it just has a really cool effect that what if this card is with Exceed Materials attributed, you can special summon a rank five or higher plant Exceed monster from your action deck or graveyard, and then attach this card to it as material. And the one um, Exceed monster that is really good for going first so there is teardrop which is the rank eight that's really good for like going second for like breaking a board down but if you want to build up some negates you tribute it and then ricka queen strana can bring out sacred tree beast hyperiton and then it can attach to the hyperiton from graveyard and that's significant because now hyperiton is a monster negate now we just got into two monster negates and we got into ip mascarena and this doesn't seem like it's crazy, but after we use the Hyperiton Monster Negate, um, we can then use IP Mascarena to go into SP Little Knight, and SP Little Knight is another interruption. Um, it's actually two interruptions in one card. SP Little Knight is actually insane. Um, and we will go more into that um, as we go later on down the line. So now we have another combo, which... We're going through all the motions again, just to show you guys, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure going to show you guys the ceiling and then let, and then build around that. So now we get to curse, we get to Naya, we add water Lily, we get our number 90, Night Sword Serpent. And this time we're going for Therion combo. Now we have Sargus in, uh, on field and we are allowed to search any Therion card from deck to hand. This time we get to search the field spell itself, Therion Disc Coliseum. Damn, that's crazy. Disc Coliseum activate, searches us Regulus. Now we're linking two here for the SP Little Knight, which seems like it's a little minus, but it's actually not all that bad. Because this, because SP Little Knight by itself is still an interruption, right? So on summon, if you use a Fusion Synchro Exceed or Link Monster, target a card in the field of Graveyard and banish it. Also, monsters cannot attack directly for the rest of the turn. So you wouldn't want to summon this on your turn going second. But going first, it's not the worst card because when your opponent activates a card or effect, you can target two face up monsters on the field, including at least one you control, banish both monsters until the end phase. So it gets to remove cards from the field. And on top of like an Omni Negate like Regulus and another Negate like Photon Lord, that's actually not too bad. Mixing that with Therion Disc Coliseum, uh, if any of your monsters are destroyed by battle, you get to add back to Regulus. And once you add back to Regulus and you detach from the uh, Photon Lord, then you get to get, uh, get Regulus equipped with Therion Empress. And Therion Regulus equipped with Empress is like the best case scenario because Empress has a really cool secondary effect that um that you can utilize to either make make more plays or to you know do something really crazy so now we are going to go into the pharaonic advent combo and again this card isn't really searchable except by small world the cool thing is though because it's level eight it's not that hard to get into um, you just use any of your Therion Empress, like any Reptile can go into Therion Empress, and Therion Empress can search Pharaonic Advent. So you can small world into this card. Um, and now we're going to see why this is so significant. 
So we add the Elysia here. We go for Naya. And your sequencing kind of doesn't matter. Um, it's it's never come up because this this version of the deck was so different. But back in the day, um, you would usually tribute Naya to summon out the Alaret from Graveyard, and then Naya would get banished. But Alaret has an effect where if it's special summon, you can target two of your banished monsters and then return them to the graveyard. As long as at least one of the two of them is is a reptile, you can return Naya back to the grave, uh, allowing you to then have follow-up for next turn. So it's like, when we're doing these combos, this is not just like we're overextending. This is making a decent two or three interruption board with follow-up still in our graveyard. So it it's like a lot more... Um, thinking about the long term than it is about just what we can do in a single turn. They get Naya, we get Snake Lily. And we're gonna go into Therion combo again here. We're gonna go Sargus, we're gonna get Coliseum. Coliseum's going to get us Regulus. And then we're gonna go into Pharaonic Admin and we're gonna tribute the Sargus so that we can have machines engraved to summon with. Uh, to equip with Regulus. And then we're going to get a Regulus to equip a Sargus to it. And then we're going to Pharaonic Advent, Tribute Lamia, search any continuous trap in the game. I chose the funniest one. I chose Summon Limit. Um, you might not be able to go for game next turn, but you but you will be able to at least lock your opponent out of making s significant plays. Um, they might be able to go into Battle Phase, attack over Pharaonic Advent, but, that's, but you don't really care because then that means you get to um, you, you can just either mill a monster off of Therion Disc Coliseum, or, you know, you can do whatever it is that you like to do. TC Boo, Rivalry, there's so many options you can get off of, uh, Pharaonic Advent. So, it's, it's really crazy that, like, now you, you kind of just get to end on a continuous trap of your choice after going into, just because you opened this quirky little level eight. And I guess they should see it coming because you because you do search it. So, like, um, I would say, I think Anti-Spell could be a, a good option as well, but it's just a lot of people are on Droplets this format. Um, I don't know if it would really matter if you made Anti-Spell, but then Theron Disc Coliseum would be able to protect you from me to show a battle anyway, so... I don't know. Um, that's why I think Summon Limit's the best one, because, like, if you can limit the number of monsters they summon, then yeah. Um... Shit, if you're playing against like a trap deck, you can roll a decree. Um, and this is like completely optional, like, this is not necessary at all. But the fact that it's just there, you know, you can side it in when you go first is, is really good. So now, um, I'm going to show you guys another combo where we have this cool ass card called Snake Rain. I don't know if you realize, but we can just mill four reptile monsters, and you, you've seen how much resource and value we, we get off of our monsters being sent to the graveyard, you know? Cast Chamber Fenrir, uh, or, or Rice Heart was around, this, this, this deck was struggling. Now, I've milled Nunu, uh, Naya, Curse, and Empress Elasia. I can't tell you if these are the correct mills, because... With the new level 10 boss monster, it, it, it actually varies as to what you want to do. You have to know the lines. It, it, it's kind of like Dragon Link, you know? It's like you, you, you kind of mill based on what you want to, like, the, the kind of uh, end board you're trying to go for. So we get to summon out the Nunu because we control no monsters. Then we're going to tribute, summon out Curse, Curse Effect, summon out Naya. And now we're going to search this new card from Age of Overlord, the... Um, as I mentioned before, it is the Ogdoatic Dawn of Creation. Um, we're going to be able to tribute our curse and summon four Ogdoatic tokens. And you're like, Nistro, why the hell haven't you been showing us this before? Because now I'm about to show you guys the fucking ceiling. Now I'm about to show you guys this fucking toxic Corona shit. All right, this is this is about to be Corona le coronavirus levels of toxic. <laughs> So we link two into our uh, Alien Shock Trooper M-Frame, uh, which will be important later on. So bear with me. And then we get to use Ogdoatic Dawn of Creation's Graveyard Effect, where you can banish itself from Graveyard, 
target a banished reptile, shuffle it into deck, and then mill a, another reptile from deck to graveyard. And we, you already know which reptile we mill from deck to graveyard when it's free. We mill the Night Sword Serpent. Night Sword Serpent gets to summon itself, go into Merrymaker, go into Sargus, Sargus, search this Coliseum, this Coliseum, add us Regulus, Regulus, get us Empress Elasia. So, literally, if we had any other card in hand, we could discard, um, we can discard a monster or discard a card and then special summon Elasia from the spawn trap zone. But because we already have um, regular sitting right here, we really don't need to do any of that. Now we're going to link summon into a link two with one of the tokens and our champion Sargus into Reptilian Echidna. Now, this is kind of like the one thing about um, the Reptilian side of the uh, Reptile package is that the Reptilian side really wants to go second because a lot of them require your opponent to already control a monster that you can manipulate to your advantage. You know, it's like Reptilian Echidna says you can make an opponent's monster zero and then it can add a reptile from deck to hand for every monster your opponent controls with zero attack. But our opponent controls no monsters. We're only using it to link up the chain, right? Because it requires any two monsters, including a reptile. So as long as one of the tokens is involved, you can make Reptilian uh, Echidna and then use... Um, Echidna plus another token to make Cosmic Slicer Z-Roll. Z -Z -Z roll However the hell you pronounce it. Now, Z-Roll on summon gets to add any monster that places um, counters, or places a counters from deck to hand. And then we get to add the Planet Pollutant Virus. The Planet Pollutant Virus is absolutely insane. This is like the toxic side of Yu-Gi-Oh. This is like Epidemic Virus, Crush Card Virus, it's like Baguska Super Saiyan. It is Super Saiyan fucking Baguska, you know? Um, you know how like we were talking about Infinitrack Road Roller when I did that Earth Machine Super Heavy video? It was like a mini Baguska. This is the next level of Baguska. Um, and uh, of course it requires a lot more setup, but you know, this this little uh, trio of, you, you know, tr trio of trouble right here is actually really, really crazy. So, by activating Planet Pollutant Virus, first off, it board wipes all face on monster to your opponent controls without A counters. So if they already had a board, this would just kill their board. It there would be just no fucking debate. Like it would just destroy their fucking board, and you'd be like, man, that was cool. You know? Um And then until the end of your opponent's third turn after this card's activation, place an A counter on each monster they summon. And you're like, Nistro, what the hell is an A counter going to do? And that's where our Cosmic Slicer Zero comes in. When it's... Monsters your opponent controls with A counters are changed to defense. Also, neither player can activate the effects of monsters with an A counter. That includes even your monsters. If, if somehow one of your monsters had an A counter on it, it would not be able to activate its effect. And the way that this works is that this is a continuous-like lingering effect lingering isn't really an official term but i'm just using it because that's like the the word that the yuga community is, is like familiar with um every time that they summon a monster on the six on the resolution of a successful summon so let's say you dodge a solemn judgment right because there's a there's like a summon negate timing and then after that summon negate timing is over okay successful summon right boom a counter immediately now, because you have the A counter, zero continuous effect kicks in, and now you do not get to activate your monster effect on summon. It's not like it's like activates and then it's negated, it's just cannot activate at all. Now, clearly this doesn't stop continuous effects, right? Um, but any monster they summon, normal summon, special summon, pendulum summon, exceed fusion, whatever, any effect on summon will not trigger at all. That is, and that is so toxic. This is like Calamity's level of toxic. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if you thought, you know, Tribute to Monster, search a little summon limit, search a little anti-spell was crazy. Imagine, uh, imagine mixing that with a Cosmic Slicer Zero roll and an Omni Negate. And a protection from battle. You know, like it's, it's actually, it's actually kind of nutty. And this isn't even the full extent of what the deck can do going first, but this is just, I just want to show you guys, like, what the goals are. 
like searching summon limit is a goal search you know getting to the planet pollutant coronavirus level of toxic is a goal in this deck going first and just just to show you guys even if you open the horror stuff here right you can snake rain do do all the shit you want immediately summoned place the defense curse immediately summon it doesn't even it doesn't even get to activate its effect to summon out an Ogdoatic from Grave. Now, great for him, he was able to summon out the Im City. What is he gonna summon off of it? What is he gonna summon off off this Im City? Reptilian Echidna? Not even able to, to switch one of my monsters to zero. And even if it was, like you would think, oh, they can just summon a Link Monster because Link Monsters aren't switched to, to defense. Even if they do get a Link Monster out. What access code can't touch this? You know? A goddamn Boral sword or whatever can't touch this. They can't touch this. They can't. They can't activate any effects. And it, because like, and this will play around most monster cards that like do anything. You know, uh, maybe except like Destiny Hero Plasma. You know, if they can get to a Destiny Hero Plasma, you know, <laughs> maybe they can break your board. But like, then then they have to worry about the Darion Disc Coliseum. And we could swing over Plasma pretty toxic. And now, even if you don't open Nunu, like, I've been showing Nunu in every hand, but it's like, the world is your fucking oyster. You have so many plays that you can make going first. And now I'm going to show you the Sakitama play. Sakitama is like a staple in rank 4 decks at the moment, so if you play any deck that uses a rank 4, Sakitama is your man. So, we, we are resolving its effect to Normal Summon itself, because we don't want to use our Normal Summon just yet. And it's gonna come up. So let's say we only have our Noya. Let's say we didn't mill. Let's say we didn't open Nunu. We only have Noya, and we mill Curse, right? This looks like oh man. Well, we tribute Sakitama, summon Curse, right? That's correct. Sakitama triggers. Sakitama, when a Spirit Monster or hold on. If this card is tributed, you target a Spirit Monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. He's a spirit monster, and he was just tributed, and he's in the graveyard. Guess who we guess who gets <laughs> gets to come back to our hand? Sakitama. And now Noya gets to search Donna Creation. It could also search Water Lily, but Water Lily would be kind of redundant at this point because we don't have four uh, reptiles in grave. So now we get to go for our link plays. Sakitama. Champion Sargus. This Coliseum, and we we're, we're gonna do the exact same combo. Zero search a uh, planet pollutant. Now this time we don't have Empress Elasia, right? We so Regulus is gonna have to leave once to Omni negates something, but we still have the follow up with like Curse and uh, Naya to search, and now we have plenty of reptiles in our graveyard, so we can. Um, Uh, search like water lily and then go into more stuff from there so now we're gonna get into the evil sore part of the combo and now I, i've i've just been showing you guys the, all the different pillars from reptile pal to um to spirit monsters to alien and now to evil sore and you're thinking nistro this is gonna be like gimmicky as hell it's actually not that bad like this is like the most this is like the best that I've seen Evil Sword look in like a long time. So just hold hold, hold on to your horses here cuz it's going to get a little spicy. So Evil Diversity allows us to search the Evil Tal Najasho. I don't know how to pronounce it. But uh, after we search we're going to dump dump Nunu, dump Alaret and then we get to normal summon Najasho. Now you're like Nisha, wait. You should have just summoned out Nunu before you summon Najasho because now you can't revive the uh, Nunu with its own effect and it's like yes that would be the case if we were not aiming to tribute the Najasho with Alaric because as you probably read when it's tributed you summon any evil sword monster from deck now what evil sword monster will you summon there's a really cool no really cool evil sword that came out of duelist nexus called evil sword rios and this is with the new support like with evil sword lars and uh, some of the other cards that, that are like brand spanking new. But when it's summoned, it gets to set 
evil singularity from your deck to the graveyard. And I have to tell you that this is possibly one of the best trap cards in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! If it's able to resolve. Because it basically says, hey, take two of your resources from Grave and just overlay any Evil Sword monster on top of it. Like, I don't really care. I don't care which Evil Sword monster it is. I don't care um, about levels or ranks or anything like that. Like, this just takes any two Evil Tal or any or, or, or Evil Sword monsters from Graveyard and just says overlay them into any, um, you know, Evil Sword exceeds. It, like, it said, fuck the rules. Like, I don't, you know. And this is kind of like a reward for playing Evasaur. And what's the funniest part about this is that you don't even have to open the Naja Show. You don't even have to open this. You can no you can open Rios, normal Rios, and then Rios has its own effect where um, if you control this card that was normal summoned or special summoned by the effect of a fire monster, you can send a fire reptile or dinosaur monster from your deck to the graveyard. And then you have the option to make two monsters on the field become the same type and level. When I first read the second part of the effect, I was like, oh wait, he can set evil singularity and then he can mill another fire or dinosaur, another evil swarm monster? That's kind of broken, but then I read, wait, you have to make two monsters on the field be become the same type and level. And at first I thought, oh, well that, that kind of sucks because that means you have to control two monsters. But because it says, then you can make, that means it's optional, which means even if you only have Rios, you don't need to control another monster to mill uh, Evil Sword. So I'm kind of perplexed as to why dinosaur players aren't on this. Like, you can summon this easily off of any baby monster. All you have to do is play two copies of this and an Evil Singularity and just get this thing to the graveyard. You know, like, that's <laughs> that's nowhere near difficult for, for a dinosaur deck, so I'm, I'm a little surprised. But I know I know the Scrap Engine is, is really good for, for the deck, and don't get me wrong, but I'm like... It's just three cards like that that you have to commit to, and that's it. Um, so yeah, that, and you, you know, especially since you guys are playing like Lido Sajim now and um, all this kind of stuff. So I'm I'm sure they can make this work if they try. But anyway, now we mill the Supreme Sovereign Serpent of Goganda, and normally it would act access if we want to make both monsters level eight here and we don't but the reason why it won't ask us here is because both monsters need to have at least one thing different alarit is already both a reptile and a level eight meaning it cannot change to become level eight and a reptile meaning you cannot resolve the second half of, of this effect even if you wanted to uh because alarit does not fit the conditions right so he mills Supreme Sovereign Serpent of Goganda. If you if you know the Albaz lore, you, you probably know that this card you know comes in during the Spring Ends era, and it can't you know and it has a an effect that like benefits it when you control the the, the Spring Ends field spell. But um, you're like Nisha, we don't have a field spell on field. But if you you know if you remember the past few combos, you know we've gone to, we've gotten into field spell pretty consistently, like just about every time except for the first turn. So now, because we control Alarit, we can summon Nunu, and now we get to play the game. The race is off. Uh, Naya, Mill Curse, Curse Tribute, Curse Summon, and again, we are under, we are under, we are under, we are under Nib right now. But if they nibbed us before we curse, we can still tribute the token, summon Curse. So that doesn't really matter. And after we summon Curse, if they nib us here, we still search the spell. And we're still, and Evil Singularity is still alive. Like, there's still two Evil Sword monsters in our graveyard. So, we're, we're, we're really not worried about what whatever the hell they have in hand at this point. But, we are going to search and still make the number 90. Just in case, just in case, you know, j j just, just make the number 90, just in case. And then we go for Water Lily, summon out Knight Sword. Overlay, Merrymaker, Sargus, Sargus Effect. Add your field spell, there it is. Add your Regulus, and there goes our Goganda. And I make IP Masquerade here because um, we did not mill Therion Empress at any point during this combo. So we have to get uh, Sargus Engraved to get a uh, Machine Monster for Regulus. And this. 
this doesn't seem too crazy, right? It's just um, Monster Negate, Omni Negate plus IP. Um, and truth be told, I should have um, overlaid with this Golgonda or, or something. I should have used it more efficiently. Like I could have made like a number 38 or something uh, using these two. And But you'll see why. So first off, at any point in the turn, we get to resolve Evil Singularity. And we get to make... Again, levels don't fucking matter. Like, these two Evil Sword monsters... Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. These two Evil Sword monsters are two different levels. We still get to overlay them into rank 6. It's not like... You know, like, it's because it's 2 plus 4 equals 6. Like, no. It's like, we can make any Lagia, Dolka, Solda. We can make any of them. But... I decided to make Lars, and the reason why you want to make Lars because it can't be targeted, and when your opponent activates a monster, uh, activates a card or effect, you can detach two, or you can detach two materials from this card, or just one, if all this card's materials are reptile and such or dinosaur. Meaning, because we use the actual cards from the archetype to make this card, this is two negates in a single card. It's two negates, and not just for monsters. This is like Red Eyes Archery and Abyss. Um. I said Red, Archfiend, Red Dragon Archfiend Abyss. Uh, so it, be, it gets to detach one and then negate any face-up card your opponent controls. Meaning spell cards, monsters, field spells, whatever it is. That's two more negates right there. So now we've went from two negates to four really quickly. That's four negates. Detach. Negate. This is like Triff Gaming level of interaction. Negate. All right, you, you got your new new negate, summon new new. We're we're chaining, and we're using our um, IP Masquerina to make SP Little Knight during the opponent's turn. They get to summon their monster. SP Little Knight says, "Because I was summoned using the Link Monster, banish." And you should note that this is still, um, this is still two more interactions during our opponent's turn because um, SP Little Knight. Can again, when your opponent activates a Carter effect, it can banish two monsters on the field, including at least one monster you control, which I, I guess in this case would mean including itself. And then go and then come back during the end phase. And also, Regulus is still here. And we have this Coliseum to protect us from battle. And if we do get destroyed by battle, we get to add Regulus back from deck to hand, uh, from graveyard to hand. So it's a really solid end board. And we still have the follow-up engrave with the curse into Naya, and then we get to um, add Dawn of Creation to get the four tokens. There's so much we can do with this. And this is why, like, I kind of preach, you know, um, try every option when you're building a deck. Try everything. Because I think it's really important for us as players to understand that like Yu-Gi-Oh is a very flexible game that is always in flux. Things are always changing, so you should always know how to adjust and to uh, maneuver around different situations because otherwise you're going to get left behind. And the last combo I want to show you is, is, is much less of a combo than it is like just a showcase of the horse and you're seeing Nistro, why are there five cards in hand for a combo? This isn't a five card combo. It's just, I just wanted to show you guys what you can do with an opening hand when you open the horse stuff, the King's Sarcophagus, the potential of all these cards, right? So, like I was saying earlier, let's say they have a Shuffler or an Ashizu statue. You don't want all your horses in the grave at the same time. You want to mill one at a time and then you want to summon it. Mill one, summon, mill one, summon. I think that's correct, no matter how you go about it. So we used our first two to just go straight into Sargus. We, we no longer need to go into Merrymaker because we have two level eights. Um, clearly there are better level eights that we can make. You know, we could have made number 90 and then just milled another two and then, and then go into Sargus, which I think would have been more correct. But um, there's a reason why I went for this route. So I want to go Disc Coliseum. I kind of want to pretend like the cards in my hand are not Empress uh, Elysia. Because obviously, you know, of course, if you draw the Therion shit, you should go into the Therion Exceed to search the Therion field spell. I mean, of course, right? But um, let's just pretend these are any any card in our deck, right? 
So now we start milling our other Horus cards and I didn't do it correctly, but hey, you remember that Golgonda that we added at the start of the turn? Thanks, and now thanks to Theron Disc Coliseum, we get to extend into a third level eight monster. And now we get to draw three cards. And you, you inflict 800 every time you draw a monster. Which I did kind of stack my deck because, you know, I have the, the um, option to not shuffle, right? And so this was kind of just to show that, you know, even with all the horror stuff, you can get back to five cards in hand. Of course, you're not like the second that you draw Nunu, you should be milling to get into your combos. Same thing. The second you draw Naya, you should be milling to get into your combos. This is not exactly. That's why I said this is not exactly a combo. This is more just a showcase that the Horus can can kind of just come in at any point and also um, help you make more rank eights easier, so that you you can dedicate more of your smaller resources to other things. Um, it may be a little harder to get to like the uh, virus lock if you're playing Horus, but it may be a little easier to get to like the Evasaur play where you um, start to lock your opponent, where you just start to make a whole bunch of like Xyz and stuff and just lock your opponent out of playing the game. So this is the real Egyptian deck, bro. Like, hold on. This is the real Egypt deck, bro. Forget all that first Yu-Gi-Oh, Diablo Star, Dark Magician shit, right? Forget that whole um, Pharaoh arc in the first Yu-Gi-Oh. This is um, this is the real Egypt. We got the the snakes, uh, snake deities. We have the Pharaoh, and we have the sons of Horus. It's crazy. Now you're you're gonna look at my side deck, and you're gonna see this plethora of options here. And uh, as I was just saying a little earlier, I really don't want you guys to like focus on making a single list when you're deck building. Like deck building is actually really hard. It's really hard. And the, the point of these videos isn't to show you like the perfect deck list because oftentimes the perfect deck list is only good for like a month or two at most. Oftentimes like competitive players switch their decks up like every event they, they switch up your list. It's it's sometimes if like the if like you're playing a really good deck and you need no changes because nothing new has come out and stuff then you can keep your list the same. But most times people are like changing ratios, changing little things. And I'd rather you guys, like my decks and stuff look a little more messier so that you guys get the full picture so that you guys get not just the ceiling, but like the, um, all the different plays around what the ceiling can do. So that's why, you know, um, it, it like, of course I'm not gonna be playing 50 cards in a deck where I need to open a three of. You know, like I'm not gonna be playing video cards in a deck like that. I don't think as and you know, you shouldn't I don't think you should mix Horus with like the evil source stuff. Um, I think Reptile Pile is fine. I think if you're gonna play Nephorabyss, you should play more you should lean more into the Reptile stuff. You could play the Evil Source stuff. I think actually that's the best version to play um Ogdo Abyss in or not Ogdo Abyss, uh Nephorabyss in. Uh, shit, I mean, you could play Ogdo Abyss if you're playing Nepta Abyss, because then it makes, uh, like, Nefer Abyss makes Ogdo Abyss, like, one of the best cards in the game. Um, Nefer Abyss just, when a monster is sent from your hand or deck to your graveyard, so when you mill or when you discard off a sarcophagus, you get to summon it, and then when it's summoned, you just summon any monster from graveyard. Um, if you're gonna play this and the Horus stuff, it works perfectly, because, um, if you keep your Horus monsters on board, they're not going to be sent to the graveyard when you resolve uh, when you resolve Ogdo Abyss. Meaning your Horus monsters can kind of just you really don't need the extra deck if you're playing Horus. You can just go for a game with like four or five like two three thousand attack monsters. You know, uh, do a Mutef. She's going to gain twelve hundred for each other Horus uh, monster you control. And if you control all four of them, like that's that's game, bro. Like that that's like you're losing the game if you, <laughs> like she's gonna be at four thousand eight hundred attack. Like holy shit, bro. Um, instant fusion for the Xox Hydra in case you want to make like a level four without normal summoning. So, uh, I mean, in a different world or in a perfect world, you can um, King of the Frail Limps, and then search Lamia and then keep going. But no, you always want to search Naya if you already have it. But if you somehow like open magical like new new plus instant fusion and you already have naya then you can go 
Exox Hydra, and then Mamiya. And because Instafusion counts as a proper fusion summon, you can revive the Hydra from Grave using uh, Nephra Abyss or uh, Water Lily because it summons any Reptile Monster from your graveyard, and then you can get its Battle Phase effect going off, which is great. You could just play Proxy F Magician, but not as strong. Um, it, it requires way too many resources. Um, so, Amnesia and uh, Aaron are cool, but I I think, again, they're more for like a Reptile Pile kind of deck. If you want to play Nefer Abyss, I think these two cards are perfect because then they it gets really control heavy. Um, when when you are, when your opponent adds a card from deck to hand, you get to discard it with uh, Aaron. And if you're playing a card like Zoha, um, when it's summoned or sent from field to grave, or when special summoned or, or sent from field to grave, you can your opponent draws one card, and then if they do, you can add a Ogdoatic monster from deck to hand. So you, you have a searcher, uh, then, um, oh, and then each player sends a card from hand to graveyard, meaning that um, if you mix that with Aaron, they draw one, then they drop one, but then they have to just, then they have to send another random card in their hand to the graveyard. So really they don't, like, they might be losing more than they gain when, when you do it like that. Again, like, I think like, if you're gonna play Ogdoatic Pure, there definitely isn't, there definitely is an ability to do that now that we have Nefer Abyss and more ways to go into um, some of our high level Ogdoatic monsters. Um, Bist deals are gonna hurt. Don't don't get me wrong. It's but I prefer Bist deals in the format to something like a Rise Heart. Um, Bist deals won't get in the way of your Therions. They won't get in the way of your Horus monsters, except for Imsidy. But that's only one out of four of them. Um, and it's like they have to use the Bist deal on the resolution of you sending it to the grave. Otherwise, it's gonna sit there, and you're gonna built in summon it, and they cannot chain a Bist deal to that. They cannot respond. It's gonna be like. Bro, you're too late. You know, especially if, if you're in Torny, it's like, bro, you're too late. You, you know, like th this is a built-in summon. There's like Machina Fortress, Cyber Dragon. It, it doesn't activate when it summons; it just summons itself. So, you know, tough luck. Uh, Fiegel, most people usually don't 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 run this one, um, because it just doesn't do enough. But again, if you mix it with like the Amnesia. You can, if they summon a monster from grave, you can send any card they control to the graveyard, like I mentioned earlier. So that means that you, you can, like, let them summon any monster, any random monster from grave when you, like, curse or when you use eagle. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, flow ghost. I, I keep looking at the OCG name. When you flow ghost, um, you can send any card they control to the grave because they summoned out a monster. Now, the only issue is, is that flow ghost lets them keep lets their monster effect stay, whereas Curse negates the monster effect that they summon back. But, you know, still. Um, Stealth Buster and Invasion's Alien Species LAS, these these are kind of cool. Um, if you, like, want to mill them, um, Stealth Buster, like, there is a quick play spell, like, A cell recombination device, where you can mill this, and then, uh, because... Like, before we had the consistency to make both alien fusions in the same turn, it's like this was kind of, like, inconsistent. So what you did instead is, like, you added the spell card that milled Stealth Buster, and then Stealth, Stealth Buster could place an A counter on any monster on field, which would not be as fast as Pollutant Virus, definitely, because it would have to be, like, if they have a, a monster effect that activates on, on summon, you would not be able to use zero's effect to stop it right you'd have to like wait but basically you, you place four a counters on one monster two a counters on another and then once it becomes your turn um you can either banish stealth buster and pop one of those cards or you know you can do a whole bunch of other things uh invasive alien species it basically says if a card's in your opponent's field zone you can tower a monster opponent controls and destroy it um and if a card is in your opponent's field zone and this card's in your graveyard, you can summon it back from grave. Uh, and basically it plays really hard into countering your opponent's um, field spells. And I think this plays around Necker Valley because it summons itself out, I believe. 
I, I keep forgetting, like, Necrovelli, they, they, like, errata this card, like, every fucking year, bro. I just need to check, like, what the current effect is. Okay, and it gets any card that moves the card in engraver to a different place. Okay, because because there was a time where Necro Valley only stopped cards that like targeted other cards in engrave, but now it, it just stops any card that would move a card in engrave, which is like, sure. Um. All right. So this this doesn't work on a Necro Valley, but there is a cool card. If you get hit with the Necro Valley, there's a cool card called. Meow's click. Um, so if a field spell is activated, you can special this card from your hand. Then if it feels, uh, then if face up cards in both field zones, this card cannot be destroyed without our card effects this turn. During your turn, the effects of face up cards in your opponent's field spell zones are negated. So, um, it's kind of cool. I don't know how you would implement this into the combo. Unless you can get like Sakitama going on. Cause like you would still need to get the two level fours. Like if you could like Sakitama plus this, plus like a snake rain, I think you can go you can go for it because then like you can uh Yeah, like you would have to open Snake Rain for this to be like broken. But you could still make it work. Definitely. So if your opponent hits you with like the quick Necro Valley, there you go. You have your Cybers card. And sign up mining exists so you can search Meow's click. Um pretty pretty uh pretty easily. Um there's a there's also small world because it's level four, so it shouldn't be too hard to bridge into a small world if you don't feel like maining sign up mining just for a side deck card. Uh now we have the reptilian side of the package, which I was discussing a little more earlier. And the reason why the reptilian side of the package is good is not just because of Kotal being able to summon itself while you, while you control a dark reptile, which can be either Naya or reptilian echidna, um, which is you know really easy to go into, or like Alarit. It's also because it's a level four tuner, so it allows you to make cards like a uh, Borosword or, or Borolod Savage or reptilian Melusine. But again. Reptilians really want to go second. They really want to make your opponent's monsters attack zero. Because if you can do that, and you can go into Echidna, have like two of their monsters with zero attack, you can add Reptilian Vasky. Vasky can tribute monsters with, with zero attack. And there is a way where it's like, if your opponent like Ash Blossoms you or something, you know, and, and, and you're still able to get Curse into Graveyard, you can tribute, you know, you can summon the Curse back, uh, the Ash Blossom back to your field when, when you summon out Curse. And then you can later on, you know, use it for something like Reptilian Hydra, which with a Reptilian Tuner and any non-tuner, you can destroy as many monsters your opponent controls with zero attack as possible, and you do draw one card for each monster destroyed. There was a point in time where the Reptilian stuff was like the best stuff that the Og that the Ogdoatic deck has ever seen, but the issue with it, which I'll say again, is that it really wants to go second. It really needs monsters on your opponent's field. Um, and it really... Like, there is a point where there was an FTK because you got so much plus. Uh, what is it? Fucking Bish Balkan. It summons out any number of tokens to your opponent's side of the field. So there was a point where you can make um, Bish Balkan and then you could go for um, Reptilian Echidna. And then after going into Reptilian Echidna, you can go into Hydra, pop all the tokens they control, draw like four cards, and then start some like FTK or something. Um, I don't fucking know. But yeah, it, it, it was something like that. that that's why I, I like really thought this deck would like pop off back in the day. But you know, FTKs are a little eh. Like after the Dragon Link FTK died out, like most FTKs kind of died out. Like really, it's only like Dinosaur and like Earth Machine that can still like FTK somewhat consistently if you don't open a hand trap. But the one caveat to that is Reptilian Ramifications. So Ramifications is like a sign up mining for two in terms of Reptilian because you send a card from hand to grave and then you get to add 
a Reptilian monster from deck to hand, and you get to add a, a Reptilian spell from deck to hand, and the spell that you can add is Reptilian Spawn. Now, before Ogdoatic Dawn of Creation, Reptilian Spawn was actually really crazy because after using like one of your Reptilian Extenders for like a Link or Synchro Summon, you can activate Spawn, just summon two tokens, and then those two tokens can go into uh, Reptilian Echidna. Uh, now, even with uh, Ogdo Ogdoatic Dawn of Creation, you can even go into Bujinki Ahashima because it's just any two monsters with the same level. It doesn't matter if, if it's token or not, then you can summon a monster from Grave, summon a monster from Hand with same level overlay into a rank eight, a rank four, whatever it is you want to do, whatever your prerogative is. But again, that's more for Reptile Pal. I don't think you should be using this in like Chorus, but you have the option. Uh, Suchinoko, just because it's a Reptile Extender that can get cards out of hand. Uh, gamma because you have to discard Nunu or discard with Snake Rain. Like a lot of um, you don't have a lot of normal summons that start your turn. It's a lot of discards, like with even with King Sarcophagus that, that start your turn. So that's why I think Gamma could do really well in this deck, depending on your build. And then we have the Reptilian Extenders. Uh, if you have a Reptile Monster in your Grave, you know, send this card from hand to Grave. And if your opponent controls a monster with zero attack, you can summon it from Graveyard. So it's a great mill. Uh, whereas Niami, if all card, if if this card is in your hand and all monsters you control are reptiles, you can target a face of monster your opponent controls. Change the attack to zero. If you do, special on this card, then you take damage equal to that monster's attack. But if it's sent to the Graveyard, a Synchromancer, you can target two face monster monsters on the field and change her attack to zero. So she can, um, she can only use one effect per turn. But at the same time, it's like, even be able to switch one extra monster to zero attack after Echidna could already do that. And then going into Reptilian Hydra. Kind of crazy, kind of nutty. Mud Dragon, because we have Proxyf, and because um, I, at one point I was thinking maybe we could Instant Fusion into it, or we could um, Super Poly into it. I think Super Poly to break down boards and then to break down those fusion monsters that you give them. Or no, well, you wouldn't be giving them monsters, you would just be stealing them. So yeah, so Super Poly to break down boards wouldn't be the worst idea in this deck because you kind of just don't want them to have a board. That's kind of the point. <laughs> like even with like the Dark Ruler and the Droplet, like you kind of just don't want to deal with like any of their negates. I think um, this deck is kind of fragile, so I think board breakers are better than hand traps because you'd rather open like multiple combo pieces than you would like a single Ash Blossom that doesn't do much or a single Imperm that doesn't do much. I'd rather open a Dark Ruler. But that's just me. Because you can very easily clear the board if you're using like the reptilian side of things. Um, if you're using like Zero or Zeus or whatever, you know, maybe. Uh, next is the Ricka stuff. You know, you go into Ricka Queen and then you tribute it for Curse or Alaric. It allows you to summon Teardrop. And Teardrop's kind of great because you can use it in the um, either the Horus or the Reptile Pal versions. And because it's like such a good rank 8, it's like it could fit right in. And, um,. Because, because Ricker Queen Strena can summon from extra deck or graveyard if you already used a uh, teardrop and it's in grave and then you go for Strena later on in the game, you can tribute it, uh, go back for, and then summon back the teardrop from the graveyard. So that's actually really cool. Um, and then Hi Hyperiton, I showed you guys it earlier. It, it's a monster negate. If you happen to go into like Discolosseum after summoning um, Hyperiton, then it can also negate spells. Because it can attach like one of the, uh, like let's say you use Water Lily, it can attach the Water Lily to it from the graveyard. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, Foolish Burial isn't really that strong in this deck because none of your mills start your combos. Um, so there's really no real use for it. Like maybe for Golgonda, but that, or maybe for like Nefer Abyss to set it up in Grave so that it has something to do while it's there. And it's like, yeah, you know, if they Bistial out some of your stuff, you can Aller it, it back into the graveyard, but still it's like they, they'd they have to like pay real close attention to that. Now, I want to talk about this new card for Horus because it becomes King Sarcophagus while it's in the field zone. And once per turn, you can add a Horus monster from deck to hand, then place a card from hand on bottom of the deck. So even though it adds them to hand, 
it's like you can add MCD and then MCD can add the actual King Sarcophagus. And then once you get all four in a grave, even if King Sarcophagus leaves the field, you're still you're still gonna have the field spell. You know. And then um Horus of Black Flame Deity. This one I, I don't think people are gonna use as much, but like it might be good if you're playing like a pure Horus deck. I'm not too sure. Um, and then we have our very funny continuous trap cards. Double hooking is one that I was actually considering because getting being able to revive both like Ogdo Abyss and like any other monster in my graveyard, uh, like a Regulus or something, sounds actually kind of goaded. Um, even like Sargus, if I control like number 90, then I could like get multiple shits off of that. Um... But yeah, it's it's just all right. And then lastly, strike sky strike race camellia to you know um because when she is sent to graveyard, you can target a monster your opponent controls, special them to this this card to their field, and if you do send that monster to the graveyard, and then you you get her back during the end phase of the turn. And she's just any two effect monsters, so she's not like uh. Uh, Azealia, where uh, Azealia needs only light and dark. Camellia, you can summon with any two monsters, basically. Except for the tokens, but it's really not that big of a deal. Um, so this would be a cool card to come out, but she's, you know, a manga card, so we have no idea when she's coming to TCG, but yeah. Um, I may not have shown you guys much with Nephorabyss, but I feel like... Ne Nephrobus is, is a card that like requires more sequencing than it does testing. It's not really a great combo piece, but it's a great, um, it's a really great floater because it gets to revive itself constantly and revive other monsters with it. So I would say if you're playing pure reptile, this is definitely the card to go to. If you're playing other versions of the deck, maybe this card isn't worth it, but I do think Dawn of Creation is worth it no matter what version of the deck you're playing. Um, there is one Ogdoidic spell that I didn't go over. And that is, uh, Serpent Strike. And so, basically, Serpent Strike is kind of like Water Lily. So, like, the reason why you might want to play Serpent Strike over a second Water Lily, right? Because we play two Water Lily because, although we don't want to draw it, we can... When it becomes turn three and we have Nunu, New New, Curse, and Alaric in our graveyard, you summon Nunu New New if you control no monsters, you tribute, you summon Curse, and then Curse summons Naya, and then Naya could summon, can search a second Water Lily to get you more, um, to get you another Reptile from deck, basically. So now, instead of having to go for a second Water Lily that could potentially brick you, going, you know, if, if you open up two of them, now you have Serpent Strike, where you just send any card from Handerfield, any monster from Handerfield to Graveyard, and you target a, a Reptile with a different attribute, then you Special Summon it, and uh, during your opponent's turn, if, they, if a monster is sent to your opponent's Graveyard, you can mill a Reptile from deck to Grave, which can either mean you're milling Nefer Abyss, or you're triggering ne uh, Nephorabyss because ne Nephorabyss can trigger because a monster was sent from your deck to Graveyard. Summon itself, summon back any other monster from Graveyard, um, which will most likely be Ogdo Abyss because you're locked into Reptile, so it's not like it gets any monster, but like... Oh no, it doesn't get the monsters on summon. Excuse me, excuse me. So, you summon Nephorabyss, and then... Um, if it's your turn, you get to summon back any other monster from Graveyard, so like Ogdo Abyss. What's really great is that if you want to summon Nefer Abyss off of um, Water Lily, you can. And then Nefer Abyss, it will not lock you into Reptile Monsters, and then you're allowed to summon any monster from your Graveyard. So that's why it's like, you could play a second Water Lily to mill the Nefer Abyss, and then summon it, and then get a re revive of any monster in your Graveyard. It's actually kind of crazy like turn three, or you can go for Serpent, uh, Serpent Strike, which is a little more consistent, but uh, the ceiling isn't as high for this card. It's really personal preference, but both of them work. You could just play all three copies of, of like two, two Water Lily, one Serpent Strike. It's really, the world is your fucking oyster with this deck. I, I, I love decks that are like this that give me so many options as to how many to, as to how to play them. Um, so let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Um, are you guys hyped for Ogdoatic post 
Age of Overlord. Um, what do you guys think about the deck? Um, I'm definitely thinking of like, I already have like most of this stuff it, besides some new stuff and some of the rank eights um, and the stellar nemesis, which like, this is like the very last monster that you summon, um, assuming that you don't go into Pharaonic Advent. This is the very last monster that you summon that could bounce a monster your opponent controls. It, it's a really hard going second card, but it's really good at going second. <laughs> um, if you have no plans to like make Zeus or anything, you're just trying to go for a game, this is a good card to make. Um, so yeah. It's been your boy Nistro here, signing out. Peace.